Chapter 2. The reasons for the many effects of limestone have not been well understood. The use of liming materials in the production of horticultural and field crops is an ancient practice that dates back to the days of the Roman Empire. Because of a lack of research and failure to recognize its merits in the exchange complex, lime has been used more or less spasmodically as a soil amendment. Its relation to crop production still is not well understood. Lime has been used primarily as a corrective for soil acidity, which probably accounts for the fact that it is still used at irregular intervals and in inadequate amounts. It has never been considered for its calcium content as an integral part of the fertilization program. No one seems to have known that plants' use of calcium and magnesium was only a small part of lime's total effect on the soil. The importance of calcium in the exchange complex and its ability to promote higher yields certainly would have received much more of the attention of American researchers if they had paid more attention to the research done in England, Germany, Holland, and Russia. There are several reasons why lime has been more or less ignored as a fertilizing material. From the dawn of crop production, land fertility was taken care of by the migrations of tribal herds from worn-out to more fertile grazing areas. These migrations continued for centuries, but we are only now beginning to realize that now we must raise crops on so-called worn-out soils because there are no ungrazed areas to move to. New frontiers of fertile lands are a thing of the past, excepting perhaps those fertile soils in the West which can be brought into production by irrigation. The adaptation of crops to special soil types has only recently been recognized. Some crops were supposed to require special fertilization practices. Soils vary tremendously in their calcium and magnesium content. The discovery of this has given rise to the thinking that certain crops can be grown profitably only in certain areas. Had there been an earlier appreciation of the importance of calcium as a plant food material, as well as of its importance as a chemical ion in the base exchange complex, our thinking would have been directed into a different channel. Natural limestone content in the soil has influenced the distribution of the agricultural population in this country. Had we known why this was so, our natural resources of plant food materials could have been preserved by improving the physical conditions of the soil. As it is, we have lost millions of tons of fertility because of sheet erosion and tile drainage. These salts have been deposited in the oceans by streams and rivers, and the process is still going on because of wasteful farming practices. The introduction of plants intolerant of acid conditions into the regions where soils were naturally low in calcium focused attention on the needs of plants for calcium. The introduction of leguminous forage crops as a source of animal feed probably has done much toward changing our ideas about the real function of applying lime to soils. The use of animal manures as a source of plant food materials for crop plants somewhat alleviated the need for liming materials because much calcium was returned to the soil in manures and crop refuse. We now know that we must add more limestone when we apply manure to the land because of the calcium needed in the additional exchange complex introduced by manure. These manures also contributed to the organic matter content, which tended to prevent calcium from being leached from the surface soil. Wood ashes, land plaster, and other soil amendments tended to postpone the day of reckoning for the need for lime. The substitution of chemical plant food materials for animal manures has focused attention on the fact that calcium replacement has been overlooked. It has had a tremendously stimulating effect on plant nutrient research. During the past 50 years, experiments set up to determine fertilizer formulas in most cases were carried out irrespective of the lime content of the soil. The close relationship between calcium and high yields is still a new idea. Many fertilizers were formulated for acid soils because many of the soil areas where experimental work had been done had their origin in acid rocks. 
The result was a number of fertilizer formulas that were extremely high in phosphoric acid. It is possible that if these formulas had been set up as a result of experiments in limestone soils, many of our common fertilizers might have carried only half of phosphoric acid content. The fact remains, however, that many agricultural soils are too low in available calcium to produce good yields regardless of the quality or quantity of fertilizer applied. In the past, larger quantities of superphosphate were used because they contained gypsum, which supplied needed calcium. Potatoes were supposed to be grown on acid soils because scab supposedly followed lime applications. Scab lesions from scab organisms are similar to those formed from fertilizer injury. Much of the scab observed in the past was from fertilizer injury and could have been corrected by heavy applications of limestone, but not hydrated lime. Of the 1.6 million acres of land in the United States devoted to only the production of vegetables, less than 500,000 probably has sufficient calcium or lime to produce maximum yields and high quality. That calcium plays a major role in promoting plant growth has not been widely appreciated and probably accounts for the fact that a million acres of land used for growing vegetable crops are insufficiently supplied with liming materials, in spite of the facts that lime is the lowest price material used in crop production and that abundant limestone is within easy access of all growers. But because its value has not been appreciated, one of our great natural resources has been insufficiently exploited. Much could be done by the federal government to make available a better quality of ground limestone. Portable soil acidity testers, from simple litmus paper to the much more complicated indicator solutions and electrical measuring devices, in the hands of farm advisors during the past 30 years, have played an important role in promoting better crop growth. But the tests have been misinterpreted so often that we have not taken full advantage of them. These acidity tests have served their purpose for pH determinations but research has shown that they have not told the entire story. Because of this, many of our soils are very much underlimed. Calcium saturation of the soil and the pH test are not necessarily correlated. On soils that have been heavily fertilized, the pH test may not indicate the deficiency of calcium. The role calcium plays in reclaiming so-called worn-out soils and abandoned soils which are reverting to the wild state is a fertile field for investigation. Many of these soils are fundamentally productive, and in areas where environmental factors are particularly suitable for crop production, they may be reclaimed with calcium applications in the form of limestone. The experiences of a few investigators indicate that these soils are worn out because the calcium level has become too low. The degree of calcium saturation has decreased to the point at which profitable yields no longer can be supported. The physical structure of the soil and the chemical equilibrium between the soil particle and the plant roots have prevented extensive root growth. A large portion of the million or more acres now used only for the production of vegetable crops may be considered depleted soils in spite of the fact that they are being farmed. Growers are putting up a stiff battle with the cooperation of government agencies to make these acres again produce crops of which they once were capable. But too often, the main attack involves merely ever-increasing applications of fertilizer. This is the wrong way to maintain a high fertility level year after year, especially when the use of lime instead of fertilizer requires only a nominal expense and is the true solution to our problem. Limestone is an investment that sometimes must be liquidated over a period of years, and many growers are financially situated so that they cannot assume such additional obligations. They are reluctant to initiate the program necessary to return these soils to the profit-producing class, although yield increases the first year will often more than pay for the limestone needed to rejuvenate the soil. One heavy application may last for 5 to 20 years 
if the calcium saturation has been raised to the necessary level. The advent of the quick chemical soil test supplementing the acidity test has helped to give us better knowledge of chemical soil and plant processes, and growers' experiences have made it possible to evaluate certain practices necessary in bringing worn-out acres back to profitable production. Much information can be obtained by observing farm practices, which result in above-average yields. Yet, were it not for the occasional grower who has been willing to study his problems conscientiously and take a chance, methods for improving soils would still be in the testing stage. One of my Ohio customers brought me two soil samples from a field that had a two-acre clay knob which had never produced anything. He said he had several of those on his farm. He had been told the knob has, was over-limed because the pH was 7.2. I tested both soils and found the available calcium in the clay knob was 800 pounds. The soil had a requirement of 3,600 pounds in the acre foot. The other sample from the lower ground had 1,200 pounds but needed 2,800 pounds. I recommended 12 tons of limestone for the knob and 6 tons for the lower ground. He applied these amounts and planted corn. He harvested 154 bushels off the knob and 147 from the surrounding area. Since then, he has corrected the calcium deficiency on four other areas with equally good results. Twenty-odd years ago, John Teacha, a neighbor in Marinette County in northeastern Wisconsin, decided he would try to grow alfalfa, much against the advice of his neighbors. Alfalfa won't grow here, they all said. It's too cold. But John had his own ideas. His farm consisted of three to nine feet of sandy loam soil, covering a dolomite some thirty or more feet thick. Lime should not be a problem here, John thought. The first trial with alfalfa was a failure. The seedlings did not look healthy. Many were killed the first winter, but John was determined to grow alfalfa. He went to a farmer's institute held in the community center house that winter and listened to a specialist from the state university talk about forage crops. If you can't grow red clover on your farm, you probably can't grow alfalfa. You may need lime, the audience was told. How do you find out you need lime? A voice from the audience asked. Get some blue litmus paper and place a piece between two handfuls of moist soil. If it turns red, it shows that the soil is medium to strongly acid. I watched John. I knew that he was interested. That noon, the group was treated to a dinner prepared by the ladies of the community. The chairman of the meeting took the guests to dinner, and John took a seat across the table from me. It was twenty degrees below zero outside, with two feet of snow, but there were sixty people at the tables. There was a great deal of interest in the farmers' institutes in those days. This was a three-day session covering everything relating to dairying and potato farming. I heard John ask, Will limestone soil become too acid to grow clover or alfalfa? Yes, it may, and very often does at the surface of the plowed layer. If you don't use some extra lime, why is that? The solution or available lime washes or leaches out of the surface, and the seedlings don't get their roots into the sweeter soil until too late in the season, and they don't make enough growth to prevent winter killing. Some seedlings may even die before the roots get started. You will always find a few plants that seem to get a hold. John told his experience. The specialist said he was pretty sure it was the result of a lack of lime because this was a sandy loam soil where lime was apt to leach out of the surface. The following year, John got some litmus paper at the drugstore and found that his soil was quite acid. He hauled two loads of byproduct lime from a sugar beet factory 15 miles away. He had to drive over muddy roads with a team of horses and a wide tired lumber wagon. I can still see those two loads as they went by. He spread the lime with a shovel over four acres of ground, and the next year he got a stand of alfalfa. At the end of the fifth year, his field was still producing eight to nine loads of alfalfa. I watched this experiment with considerable interest because it was something different. 
we had always depended on manure. If we bought chemical fertilizer, it was a hundred pound bag for an acre of sugar beets. But to be able to reuse the limestone after once using it to purify sugar in order to grow better crops was something that required serious consideration. We had millions of tons under our farm, but it wasn't available. It had to be ground. I appreciated the full importance of the possibilities. This was very revealing, getting results from limestone on limestone soils. When one realizes that millions of tons of calcium carbonate are buried under our soils and that we depend on our food for calcium, one wonders why we were so well provided for. It has been my privilege to travel over many of the cropping areas of the central, eastern, and southern states, conferring with growers. Lime or calcium has been one of the crying needs of most of them. Were it not for the fact that barnyard manure has been available, many more farms would be added to the list of those abandoned because the soil no longer would produce enough crops to pay the taxes. Now we are beginning to realize that the addition of sufficient limestone alone can restore fertility. If the lime needs of the soils in the New England states and some of the coastal plain states are an indication of the calcium condition of the 1.6 million acres on which vegetables are grown in this country, the limestone under the farm on which I spent my boyhood days, if applied to these hungry acres in a finely ground form, would produce sufficient profits to pay off the national debt. We would probably be farming fewer acres at a greater profit, and that deposit was only a drop in the bucket when compared with the accessible limestone deposits in practically every state in the Union. Limestone seems to be one of our natural resources which has not been overworked and which will never be depleted. It is one of the least expensive materials growers have to buy. But of those commodities the growers feel they need to grow good crops, it is probably the most difficult to sell. Some 40 years ago, I assumed the responsibility of managing a 600-acre lumber company farm in northern Michigan. This farm had been producing timothy hay and pasturage for many years for the logging camp horses, which were kept there every summer. However, plans were made to build a dairy and grow all the feed, grain, clover, and alfalfa, that was needed to feed 40 cows. I soon found that clover and alfalfa were out of the question unless something was put on the soil. The climate was supposed to be too cold. The yields of none of the crops were good. A county agricultural agent visited us from one of the counties in the lower peninsula of Michigan. He came on a raw, cold, late April day, and we sat in the barn and talked about lime and manure and what the condition of the soil probably was. He had good judgment about farming and said that he had been raised on a farm. He was a graduate of the state college at East Lansing. He said he didn't know much about the Upper Peninsula, however. Has anybody grown alfalfa in this county? I asked. I don't know of anybody. Do you think it's possible? I imagine so, but you know this farm has been horse pasture so long that it will be hard to get alfalfa started. What are the important things to consider? Variety, inoculation, lime, and manure. We have enough horse manure to put five good loads on each of the ten acres on that field at the end of the barn. We can get lime from the sugar factory at Menominee, Michigan, and... I can send to the university for the bacteria to inoculate the seed. But where can I get the seed? I will get some grim seed for you. That is pretty hardy and should stand the winters here. Let's see, you need 150 pounds. How much lime will I need? Let's go out and test the field. He took a package of blue litmus paper out of his pocket and handed it to me. He then picked up a sliver from a fence rail and dug a hole picked up a handful of loose soil, roughly molded it into a ball, and broke it in half. Put a piece of litmus paper on this half, he said. He placed the two halves together and placed the ball in his pocket. Then he walked down the slope and repeated the operation three more times, each time picking a spot that was representative of certain areas of the field. We walked back to the barn to get out of the cold wind, laid the four balls of soil in a row, and broke each open to expose the blue litmus paper. 
but the paper was red, bright red in the ball taken from the highest part of the field, and a pinkish red in one taken from the lowest part of the field. There you are, that one, he said, pointing to the deep red strip. Shows a lime need of at least three tons per acre, that one, two, and those two, one ton. You probably need about forty tons of lime. Better have a carload shipped up. Want me to order it for you? He certainly was a great help to me. In answer to my question as to why the lower part of the field was sweeter than the high ground, he said, Leaching and surface runoff by water have brought the lime down the slope. Even in the lower places, the lime had leached out of the surface. The subsoil below the plowed depth was much sweeter. The main reason for putting lime on the surface was to get the seedling started. This was the same story I had heard from my neighbor at home several years ago. I got the lime and put it on top of the plowed ground, using a team of horses to pull the wagon and a large scoop shovel to spread the limestone. The forty tons of limestone was spread unevenly. The teamsters who were clever at driving teams in the lumber woods during the winter were not so clever with the scoop shovel, and this seemed like a lot of nonsense to them anyway. When the fine dust got in their hair and eyes and through their clothes, it began to irritate their skin. They did considerable cussing, and when they tried to wash the lime off their hands, it was like rubbing sandpaper on their skin. I was glad it had been spread. The field was covered pretty thoroughly except for an irregular strip along the fence. This was fortunate because it made an experiment out of the field. The alfalfa seedlings grew well, as did a heavy crop of pigweeds and other weeds common to the locality, which were probably brought there by the manure that we applied. The result was that the field had to be mowed to give alfalfa seedlings a chance to grow. It wasn't until September that the results of the lime could be seen. The irregular strip along the fence that had no lime was patchy, and the alfalfa did not look vigorous. The limed portion of the field was fine. The next year, the unlimited area along the edge had no alfalfa. I left the farm that winter and did not see the field until three years later, just as they were about to cut the second crop. It was a beautiful stand, except for the irregular strip along the fence where we had not put any lime. There was no alfalfa there, and the foreman told me that this strip had died out in spots the first winter and was completely dead the following spring. They had taken 26 large loads of hay from the first cutting. I saw this field in 1961, some 40 years later. The alfalfa was gone, but the crop of corn on the field was very good. A friend of mine had several dairy farms just outside of Elgin, Elgin, Illinois, where his tenant is now able to grow tremendous corn crops. Some years ago, he asked me to look at his alfalfa field, which he said was very patchy. As we drove over the fields, I noticed that the best alfalfa was in areas alongside a gravel road. Cars traveling along the road raised dust, which was carried onto the field when the wind was in the right direction. The gravel on the road contained limestone pebbles, so that the dust probably had some calcium in it. There was no doubt but that the dust contained something that was good for the alfalfa, but it did not make much difference to the corn crop. As we drove along the cornfield, he said, Look at that corn, ten foot high but small ears. It seems that the ground ought to grow alfalfa. Yes, it should, except for one thing. Alfalfa needs a lot of calcium. Have you ever used calcium on these farms? Don't recollect as I have. What is it? You know what prepared building lime is? You can get the raw rock, ground fine but not burned, and apply it to the soil to sweeten it. They call it ground limestone for agricultural purposes. Oh, yes, he said. Guess I did hear about it. I can get down toward Joliet. If I were you, I would apply two or three tons of this to the acre. In the meantime, I took some samples of the soil with me to make sure that I was correct in my diagnosis. The soil tested medium acid, or pH 5.4. The calcium reading was too low. Three years later, on a trip through Elgin, I stopped in to see him again. Almost his first greeting as I stepped from the car was, How would you like to drive out to the farm? He had a twinkle in his eye. 
I'm the only one who has alfalfa around here, but it isn't quite right yet. Maybe something else is out of line. As we drove into the yard, I saw three large piles of ground limestone in one field. What have you got out there? I asked with a grin. Oh, that is white gold. White gold, I said. Pretty cheap gold, isn't it? Seventy-five cents a ton if I haul it. That seems pretty cheap for ground limestone. How much have you used? Every acre on this land has had three tons except that field yonder. We started across a twenty-acre alfalfa field where he had some bad spots. See those yellow leaves near the bare spots? Got a few of those scattered over different fields. He stopped the car and we got out for a closer inspection. Sheep sorrel was growing where the alfalfa had killed out. Most of the field had a beautiful stand of alfalfa. Looks to me as though you haven't used enough lime on these spots. But I put on three tons, he exclaimed. The soil is high in organic matter, which means a high capacity to absorb lime. This is a silt loam soil that might take four or five tons of lime to raise the pH from five to six. What did you say? he asked. pH? Oh, yes. That is merely a symbol that is used to designate a certain amount of acid in the soil. By calculation, we know it takes a certain amount of lime to sweeten the acid or sour condition from pH 4, which is strongly acid, to pH 5, which is medium acid, to pH 6, which is slightly acid, or to pH 7, which is neither acid nor sweet. Above pH 7, we say it is alkaline, like some of the desert soils, which may be pH 9 or 10. We speak of those as alkali soils, which may be pH 9 or 10. We speak of those as alkali soils. That happens where you do not have much rainfall. Now, your soil tested pH 5.4, and I figure it would take three tons of ground limestone to sweeten it to test pH 6.4, in which alfalfa should grow pretty freely. You made a good guess except for these spots. Yes, it was partly a guess, because if this had been a sandy loam soil, it might have taken only one ton to sweeten the soil from pH 5.4 to pH 6.4. The amount of lime needed will vary with the type of soil. Let's drive over and look at the limestone. I can't understand why you have these apparent acid spots in the field after using three tons of that limestone. The limestone proved to be a coarsely ground material. I can sec why you got your white gold for so little money. I doubt whether 15% will pass through a 60 mesh sieve. This material does not act fast enough. If you used a ground limestone, of which 65% would pass through a 100 mesh sieve, you would not have those bare spots in the field. Of course, it would have cost you more. Why doesn't corn need lime like alfalfa? He asked. I don't believe my corn is any better where I used lime. That is an involved question. It does need limestone, but most of us think it doesn't. The soil needs the lime to make it possible for plants to make efficient use of the fertilizer in this soil. They are thinking about the crop instead of the soil. Many advisors claim that alfalfa is a leguminous plant that is classed with plants that will grow best only where the pH of the soil is between 6 and 6.6. .6. While corn is in the medium acid group and will grow at pH 5.5 to 6, but not as well as at pH 6.6. .6. This, of course, is not good thinking. Even though corn grows at pH 5.5 to 6.0, it will do much better if it grows at pH 6.8, or where the available calcium is adequate because the physical condition of the soil is better. We want to get the soil colloids practically saturated with calcium as high as 87%, according to some authorities. Alfalfa does not tolerate soluble aluminum and iron in any appreciable amounts when present in the soil, while corn can tolerate some. Furthermore, alfalfa requires more calcium than corn does. What is this aluminum you're talking about? It is a funny coincidence, but our best, most fertile soils have quite a lot of aluminum and iron in them. It helps to make them hold their fertility but iron and aluminum are very toxic to plants if they get into the soil solution on which your plants feed. Iron and aluminum are quite insoluble in that soil. That is, they are not available to plants if the pH is above 5.5. As the soil becomes more and more acid below pH 5.5,
More and more of this aluminum and iron dissolves in the soil water from which plants must get their food materials. Plants like the potato can grow on these soils because aluminum does not hurt them so much. But for most plants, we have to use our white gold to sweeten the soil and keep the iron and aluminum where it belongs, out of solution. Grouping plants according to the pH at which they will grow the best is not quite correct. It would be more efficient if they were grouped according to their tolerance to aluminum, because many plants in the high pH group will grow at pH 4 in soils, which have practically no aluminum or iron in them. It has been shown that if organic matter is put on a soil too acid to grow carrots or beets, it will make it possible to grow those crops successfully. Organic matter apparently takes aluminum and iron out of solution so that they are not available to be taken in through the roots. 16% superphosphate has been shown to have a similar effect on acid soils. That is why our mixed fertilizers are usually high in phosphoric acid. We have to correct the soil physically and chemically. I didn't realize I was doing so much to my soil by putting a little ground limestone on. I appreciate why you call this limestone white gold. It certainly would mean a lot more to growers if they used more of it. How did you pick the name? My man on the farm said this stuff was like finding a gold mine, but I said it was pretty light-colored for gold. He said he had thought of white gold. And so it was, white gold for crop plants. As I left my friend in Elgin, I pondered this question. What would growers do without limestone, without the calcium that plants take out of the soil to cement their cells together? If it is lacking, the cells fall apart and die. They appear to be rotting. If plants do not get enough calcium, the growing tips die because there is nothing that will take the place of calcium for this purpose. If calcium is so low in the soil that plant roots can't grow and function properly, deficiencies of other ions may occur. A pH test is supposed to indicate the calcium level of the soil. However, with the use of large quantities of fertilizer, the calcium requirement is high, and a pH test does not give a true picture. In addition to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, plants also need large quantities of calcium. But in addition to being a plant food material, calcium also has many other functions in the soil. 85% of the total base saturation of a soil must be satisfied with calcium. The pH records the strong ions like ammonium and potassium, but not the calcium ions because they are weak by comparison. Thus, the pH test does not give us a true picture. In warm area soils naturally have a higher pH, and very often a neutral soil of pH 7 may be completely devoid of available calcium. So poverty grass takes over because it is the only thing that will grow in such soils. Once I was called upon to consult with a grower of greenhouse cucumbers. The plants seemed to grow fairly well, but had brown roots and water-soaked areas on the leaves, typically calcium deficiency symptoms. But when a pH test of the soil was made, it tested 6.8. Apparently, this was not a calcium problem, but the symptoms were there. Furthermore, other crops showed similar symptoms. Chrysanthemum flowers, when cut from plants growing on this soil, wilted quickly and failed to revive when placed in water. The same was true of other plants. Tomatoes did fairly well, but the foliage seemed watery and light-colored. These all were symptoms of calcium deficiency, which could be demonstrated in sand cultures under controlled conditions. A lengthy chemical test of the soil was made. It showed abundant phosphorus and abundant potassium. And, according to the soil acidity test, the soil had plenty of calcium, since the pH was high. What was the explanation? A calcium test had not been made. The problem was solved by thoroughly mixing the soil, then dividing it and placing it in a number of 10-inch pots. These different pots were treated with salts, which would accentuate or decrease calcium deficiency in the plants. A number of potassium and calcium salts were added to the pots, and cucumber seed was sown in each. The plants came up normally and showed very little difference until they were about a foot high. Then things began to happen. 
The plants that received potassium nitrate and the check, along with those who received no additional chemicals, showed slight calcium deficiency symptoms, while potassium sulfate produced very severe symptoms. Plants grown with potassium chloride were free from such symptoms, but the growth was not particularly improved. Calcium sulfate had a slight corrective effect, while calcium chloride, calcium nitrate, hydrated lime, and magnesium hydrated lime completely corrected the deficiency symptoms and produced a particularly well-balanced growth. Apparently, even though this soil had a liberal amount of calcium, not enough was available to the plants. Furthermore, potassium sulfate accentuated the difficulty, while potassium chloride tended to correct it. Calcium chloride also corrected the condition. Apparently, some salts, which tend to keep calcium in solution, were more helpful than those which resulted in insoluble calcium salts. Even though this soil contained tons of calcium, it was not available to the cucumbers. It apparently was not being released into the water solution where the plant roots could get it. It has been shown that a high concentration of potassium will prevent calcium from becoming available to plants. When the calcium-supplied plants were examined, the root growth was extensive and free from injury on all plants, which showed normal growth, while the plants showing injury had poor roots, which in many cases were brown or dead. As a result, calcium nitrate, as the source of nitrogen, and limestone were applied to the soils in the greenhouse. The crops no longer showed that soft, watery growth, but made a dark green normal type of growth. The interesting thing about that is that the fact that before corrective treatments were made on this soil, the plants were very susceptible to mosaic-like diseases, which were often mistaken for true mosaic diseases. These all disappeared after the available calcium was increased. It may be asked, why did this soil get into this condition? The answer seems evident. The grower tested the soil found the pH was 7.6 to 8.4, and decided it had to be lowered. The quickest method was to use sulfate of ammonia and sulfate of potash, which brought the pH down below 7.0, but which caused such an accumulation of potash in the soil and plants that the small amount of calcium apparently was not absorbed by the plants. The plants took in tremendous quantities of potassium, but not enough calcium to keep the ions in the juices in the plants in equilibrium. This was further studied in sand culture, where conditions could be controlled to one factor. The results were identical with what had been observed on the soil. If the plants took in too much potassium or sodium and not enough calcium, the growth was soft and wilted easily. The plants did not build up protein as rapidly as those where the calcium was high. Furthermore, these soft plants proved to be very susceptible to certain physiological disorders. This proved to be a practical demonstration of antagonism, a phenomenon which every student of plant physiology must learn. Antagonism means that if living protoplasm is in contact with calcium and potassium or sodium, at certain concentrations those two materials neutralize each other's toxicity. Calcium or sodium alone would be toxic, but if one part of calcium and ten parts of sodium are mixed, the toxicity of each disappears. This principle, which is demonstrable between calcium and potassium or sodium, also holds for calcium and ammonium or calcium and any other material of a similar alkaline nature, but does not hold between calcium and materials of an acid nature. Thus, it is possible to produce calcium deficiency in a soil as well as in sand or water culture, even though appreciable quantities of calcium are present. Too little attention has been paid to this fundamental principle. In practical terms, this means that growers have not used sufficient lime or calcium-carrying fertilizers to maintain a good balance in the soil. More specifically, our fertilization practices have permitted the formation of only partial calcium saturation of the soil complex. There are no ions that will take the place of calcium in this respect. Strontium, under certain conditions, will partially substitute for calcium. 
It would seem that the pH and available calcium are not correlated and that it is necessary to depend on a calcium test if chemical fertilizers are to be used intelligently. This is particularly true on vegetable-producing farms, where one-half to three tons of chemical fertilizers have been used yearly, irrespective of liming practices. This is also particularly true of alkali lands, which have a high pH, but on which crop plants respond to lime or calcium-carrying fertilizer materials. These soils have so much sodium and potassium that they suppress the action of what little calcium may be present, and, as the pH increases above the neutral point, the calcium tends to become less and less available. There are certain localities where during the years calcium carbonate has accumulated in an appreciable layer at varying depths below the surface. This has not been due to farming practices. Such soils may be low in calcium in the surface layer. Conditions have been favorable for calcium salts to settle out. Also, there may be naturally high calcium soils. Such soils may have an abundance of calcium but it is necessary to add other fertilizer salts to neutralize the effect of high calcium. Such soils usually respond to potassium according to the principle of antagonism. They often respond to a 20-30% to 30 potash fertilizer. They are not very common. The potassium content is high enough to kick calcium out of the exchange complex and make it available to the plants. Such cases are not as much of an exception as many people think. They occur on soils having a high absorptive capacity, high clay and organic matter content. That is, they can hang onto large quantities of calcium and potassium before any appreciable amount is available in the soil solution for the growing crop because of the high clay and organic matter content. Peat and muck soils are a good example. These soils release ammonia nitrogen during hot weather and need to release into the soil solution large quantities of calcium. If they are in acid regions where the surrounding upland is quite acid, they may need much more calcium. I have recommended as much as 40 tons per acre and have had excellent results. Greenhouse roses respond to heavy calcium feeding. Much can be learned by growers from experiments to determine their own particular soil needs for calcium or magnesium. A greenhouse rose grower has considerable trouble getting a type of growth that was conducive to a high yield of good quality roses. He asked me to examine the plants and diagnose the trouble. He had been a student of mine and had been reluctant to call me in, but he said, I have been trying to figure it out with the principles which you taught me but it seems I can't make them fit together, so they do me any good. I told him, if we can set up sand culture experiments on the basis of those principles and reproduce certain plant responses time after time, they must be sound. If you can't do that on this soil, it means there is something about the soil you haven't found out. I may have slipped up on my reasoning, he said. Well, let's have a look and see what is wrong with your plants. The plants appear to have too little calcium, so I naturally inquired, what is the pH of the soil? Practically neutral. Have you tested for calcium? No, but I have used calcium nitrate on this bed, and it is no different from the others. This was a little disconcerting, because calcium nitrate will correct a low calcium condition. I took my test kit and microscope to his greenhouse and went to work. The plants were soft and watery with very little substance to them. The leaves were small and had a sickly yellow appearance. I tested for all the things I had equipment for and decided that the symptoms were truly those associated with insufficient calcium. So I asked, Are you sure those solutions you have for your tester are all right? He didn't know. So I took a sample of soil from several beds, had the available calcium determined, and found the test to show a trace of calcium, low to medium magnesium and phosphoric acid, and high potassium and nitrogen, a typical proportion of plant nutrient materials which, if used in a sand culture, would produce the type of growth found on those roses. What was needed was more calcium, 
so an application of two tons of dolomitic ground limestone was made over all the beds. Then, five plots were selected, each 50 square feet, and an additional ton of limestone per acre was applied as a check against over-liming. This lime was applied in the middle of August. The prospects of a Christmas crop were poor. 20,000 roses were a liberal estimate. Four weeks later to the day, Frank hailed me on the street and said, I wish you could see those roses. You wouldn't know the place. How were the plots that had the extra ton of limestone, I asked. You know, it's a funny thing, but those plants are growing faster than the others. I gave orders to have another ton of limestone worked in between the plants. What are you using for fertilizer? Tankage and horse manure for mulch. I saw the roses several weeks later, and I could hardly believe I was in the same house. The plants had made four to six inches of new growth. The leaves were large and had that rosy green cast that growers like to see on growing plants. I noticed particularly that breaks were evident at the axles of the leaves as well as on the lower part of the stems where those large heavy canes originate. Had it not been for those plots scattered through the house, the grower would not have used more than two tons of limestone. Because these high lime plots continued to grow faster than the others, half-ton applications of ground limestone were made until the houses had received seven tons of limestone during a year's time. The first Christmas harvest was 39,000 roses instead of the anticipated 20,000. A year later, it was 105,000. And since that time, he had an exceptional yield, which has been continuous regardless of crops pinched for holiday seasons. The important observation made here was that even though five tons of limestone had been added to a soil which was only six inches deep in beds underlaid with cinders, the pH remained about 6.6. This soil is considered a heavy, sandy loam of the Sassafras series, containing considerable organic matter. A quick soil test a year after the first application of lime was made showed a reading of very high calcium and high nitrate nitrogen, low to medium phosphoric acid, and high potash and magnesium. The tankage and manure used as a mulch supplied ammonium nitrogen, which could be readily absorbed by the roots because of the near-neutral pH and abundant calcium, or could be oxidized to nitric acid, which, when neutralized by the limestone, was taken in as nitrate nitrogen. These changes, the formation of acids, undoubtedly prevented any tying up of iron, manganese, and boron, which sometimes is associated with too much hydrated lime in the soil. It did demonstrate the need for applying sufficient limestone to supply the lime requirements on a soil in which heavy mulches are continually maintaining a high level of chemically active organic matter. One of the dangers of too much lime, supposedly, is that it ties up the minor elements in the soil so that they are unavailable to the plant. This occurs with burned lime, but is not very much with pulverized limestone. The difference in solubility of the two forms of lime is responsible. I have yet to find a case of overtiming injury where a grower has used limestone and some form of ammonia as his source of nitrogen. In almost all cases that have come to my attention when stunting of the plants or definite injury occurs following a heavy application of burned lime, nitrate has been used as a source of nitrogen. There is considerable experimental evidence to show that nitrate nitrogen is most efficiently used by plants at a low pH of 4, while ammonium nitrogen is most efficiently used if the growing medium has a near neutral pH. Furthermore, if plants are supplied with only nitrate nitrogen at near neutral pH, chlorosis due to iron deficiency may develop and may be difficult to correct. Using ammonium nitrogen at these same pH values very seldom gives any indication of iron deficiency. In a soil, ammonium nitrogen does not remain as much for any appreciable period, so that plants probably only absorb a small percentage of that released in the soil, a very small percentage. The formation of nitric acid and subsequent nitrates undoubtedly 
helps to maintain some available minor elements for the growing plants. Potash deficiency may occur where too much burned lime has been used due to the fact that the plants must take in too much calcium for the potash they can get. Experimental results show that some plants grow best when the solution contains 5 to 7 parts of available calcium to 1 part of potassium. These relationships between nutrient materials in the soil are extremely important to the welfare of the plant, and calcium plays a major role in these relationships. Asparagus is a heavy feeder on calcium. Crops vary in their calcium needs. Asparagus requires large quantities of calcium. It actually uses more calcium in its growth than it does nitrogen, phosphorus, or potash. Yet, most growers try to grow asparagus without lime. The results is inevitable. Average asparagus yields the country over vary from 80 to 110 crates per acre. Growers who make a practice of keeping the available calcium reading in the soil high or very high are harvesting up to three times that yield. Two neighbors had an argument as to whether asparagus needed lime. One grower argued that there was enough calcium in their soils, but the others disagreed. Each went his way. I saw the acre yields of these two growers covering three years of harvest. The yields on the limed farm kept increasing each year. The grower, who did not keep his calcium reading high, had the opposite result. His yields were gradually decreasing. The highest yielding bed of asparagus I have ever seen, 350 to 400 crates per acre, had been given two tons of dolomitic ground limestone every year for six years. The pH was neutral. Every year, this grower also used manure and mixed fertilizer containing nitrogen from sulfate of ammonia. There were plenty of growers in this area who were using the same amount of fertilizer without lime, and their yields were only average. Growers should experiment with an acre or even a smaller plot to find out whether lime will give a response. This is as true for all crops as it is for asparagus. It is impossible for any experiment station worker always to make a recommendation that will cover all cases because he does not know what has gone on before. He can, however, advise the grower about certain trials that might be made to determine what will prove to be good practice for his soil. The question may be asked, why put on lime to correct acidity and then add a fertilizer that will make it acid? That question has been asked by many growers. The answer is the result of experience. See the discussion that follows. I set up what I considered an ideal experiment a number of years ago on Cape Cod. It involved six acres of 40th acre plots. Each plot replicated six times. The crop was asparagus. The soil was beach sand, which at the time had only a few brambles growing on it. We had fertilizer quantities up to 1,200 pounds per acre on different plots. Arthur Brenner, the cooperator, was a good grower, and I found him an excellent cooperator. We prepared our plots and set in one-year asparagus roots on June 1st. We were very careful to have them all of uniform size. The asparagus started to grow uniformly. Less than 1% of the roots failed to grow. The last week in August, Arthur called to tell me that something peculiar was happening. We examined the field and noticed that the asparagus on the north half of the field was two feet tall and well-branched, while the asparagus on the south half had only six to eight inches of growth. The first thing that I thought of was residual fertilizer. When I asked Arthur about that, he informed me that the land had not been farmed for three years. Before that, carrots had been grown on the north half and turnips on the south half. The weeds had been so bad in the carrots that they were plowed under, while the turnip crop was kept clean and harvested. When we checked the plot treatments, there was no difference on either half of the field. The soil test showed nothing. The second year, the plants on the south half looked almost as good in late summer as those on the north half after a season's growth but the fertilizer treatments did not produce any difference in volume of growth that year. I never did hear what happened to these 
plots in later years because I left the Massachusetts Experiment Station before I could make further observations. In another experiment that I set up in Massachusetts, I picked a piece of ground between two stone fences. This land had been cultivated for many years. It was a good silt loam with a high organic content, the result of having manure applied with wood shavings for many years. The field was plotted with various amounts of fertilizer and plant with uniformly large asparagus roots. By the end of the first year, I had another failure. The plants along the edges were three feet tall, but toward the center of the field, they became successively shorter. In the center of the field, they were only one foot tall. The surface of the field did not indicate any irregularities. We dug holes, beginning at the center of each field, every ten feet working toward the outside. The surface soil, eight inches deep in the center, gradually increased to twenty-four inches deep on the margins along the stone fences. We discovered a well-developed plow soil which the roots could not penetrate. The subsoil of this field was low in available calcium. Apparently, the organic matter in the surface soil and the depth of the soil counteracted the magnitude of the deficiency of calcium in the subsoil on the growth of the experiment. The soil composition and amount of topsoil proved more important than the fertilizer that we had applied. I mentioned these things because most people have the idea that to grow a crop, all you have to do is find out how much fertilizer is needed for good yield, apply the fertilizer, and reap the harvest. Usually the result is a 35 to 65 bushel yield. Actually, after 25 years of research and observation, I am of the opinion that chemical fertilizers play a minor role in our yields, even though tremendous amounts of fertilizer are required. The fact is, often the major cost of growing the crop is the cost of fertilizer. If one puts sufficient thought on the problem, one soon realizes that there are yield-controlling factors which are far more important than fertilizer. Many of the ideas that we accept as proof of the pro-fertilizer philosophy are merely much-repeated idle comments made in the early days of the industry, which we would find difficult, if not impossible, to prove today. I was called in on an asparagus problem in eastern Maryland. This gives some idea how much limestone may sometimes be needed. A fertilizer company was being blamed by a grower on a farm on the eastern shore of Maryland for a low yield and poor quality of asparagus. I value this grower's friendship, so I will not give his name. He had had the reputation of supplying a commission merchant on the New York market with top-quality asparagus. They put up a banner across their booth announcing when his asparagus was available. In most recent years, he had lost the name. He blamed his fertilizer company for his troubles, since they had advised him to switch to a neutral fertilizer to avoid applying lime. He was a Cornell graduate and amused himself by reading science, soil science, and other scientific journals. He had called in specialists from several experiment stations and had received a different explanation from each as to the cause of the trouble. A representative from his fertilizer company called me in for advice. I immediately recognized his problem as calcium deficiency. This was met by a derisive laugh on his part. He had tested the soil and the pH was okay. It was a little above neutral. I told him it might still be calcium deficiency and that there was only one way to find out, lay out some lime plots to see what happened. This he agreed to do. He took two rows of asparagus across the field and applied one ton of limestone per acre. On the next two, he applied two tons. On the third pair, three tons. On the fourth pair, four tons. And on the fifth pair, five tons of limestone per acre. This was done at the end of the cutting season around the middle of July. Late that fall, I was invited to inspect these plots. I had an approximate idea where the plots were, and as I drove along his lane, which was beside his asparagus field, I was surprised to see two rows of asparagus that had made at least twice as much growth as any others. Since there were ten rows in the experiment, and only two showed any improvement over the rest of the field, I did not associate the good growth with the limestone treatments. 
When we arrived at the house, the grower asked me whether I had seen the experiment. I said no, but that I noticed two rows of asparagus far above the others. That is the experiment, he said. I asked him which treatment showed up. He said it was five tons. When I asked him what he was going to do now, he answered, I have ordered 250 tons of pulverized limestone to put on the field. As soon as I find I can get it, I will start hauling. That means over 40 trips to the quarry in Pennsylvania. Two years later, he stopped in to see me on a return trip from the New York market. Well, I topped the market with my asparagus again this year, he said. It was some eight years later, after I had moved to Virginia, that he had stopped by to see me on his way home from Florida. He had spent some months recuperating from some sickness and did not mention asparagus. I asked him whether he was still in the asparagus business. He pointed out the window and asked me how I supposed he had bought that new Cadillac who was paying for the sojourn to Florida. Are you still topping the market? I inquired. Never missed, he answered. The secret of growing asparagus is to pile on the limestone. I am putting some on every year. Do you think you need it? I asked. I don't know, but I'm not taking any chances. It costs money to gamble. There is a general feeling among horticulturalists that, from a fertility standpoint, asparagus is a hard crop to work with. Results are often confusing. The difficulty seems to be in the starting point. None can be gained from fertility studies if calcium deficiency is the limiting factor. I wasted a lot of time conducting fertilizer experiments on asparagus until I discovered that asparagus is a lime-loving plant needing a large amount of available calcium because of rapid root growth. Physical and chemical soil conditions, therefore, were controlling factors in its growth. When there was sufficient calcium available, fertilizer treatment showed growth differences which might result in increased yields. During my teaching days at Rutgers University, I had the pleasure of presenting to a group of short course students a practical course on plant nutrition. One day during my discussion on lime, I made the statement that a pH test did not necessarily tell the lime needs of the soil, particularly for asparagus. After the lecture, one of the students stopped and said, Did I understand you to say that a pH test was not enough to determine the lime needed in soil? That seems true from my experience, I answered him. After considerable discussion, he told me his father owned 100 acres of asparagus. They had tested the soil for acidity, and it always tested neutral, so they had never bothered to apply any lime. And if asparagus needed a lot of lime, he wondered whether this yield might not be low because of that. Since he had learned how to run a soil test in his laboratory exercises, I suggested that he bring some samples from the asparagus field and test them for calcium. It would be good experience for him. He brought 20 samples, tested them, and got no test for available calcium. He couldn't understand it. He brought his father along one Friday morning, and we discussed their problem. I suggested that they start applying one ton of pulverized limestone each year until their yields reached a higher level. His father had difficulty agreeing with my ideas, but since they had tried everything else while acre yields continually fell to lower levels, he figured he would not lose anything. I told him not to apply any fertilizer until he could see an increase in an acre strip on their field where he continued to apply the lime. I also told him that he must believe in me because it might take several years before the limestone really began to show results in larger yields. They applied a ton of magnesium limestone every year for seven years. I had heard nothing from him about his asparagus project until he walked into my office five years later with ten tin cans full of soil. I asked him whether he had troubles. He said, no, but I wanted to check the soil and talk with you. After he told me the following story, I asked him whether I could repeat it. He said, do anything you want, since it is really your story. My dad had grown asparagus for many years and had always been able to pay the bills. But during the five years, yields were getting lower each year. When I came to take the short course, father was in debt to the tune of $9,000. We had to do something different or stop growing asparagus. When we found out what we should do to increase our yields, we followed your liming program faithfully. 
the second year after the first limestone application was made, our yield was slightly better, and we felt we might be on the right track. The yield was increasing each year up to the present time. During the past five years, many things have happened. I married my high school girlfriend, and my father built me a nice home. We have increased our plantings to 200 acres, and this year, after paying our bills and feeding two families, we had a balance of $7,000 in the bank. He gave me some figures on their average acre yields, but all I remember about them is the general trend. This soil was a sassafras collingston fine sandy loam. Ordinarily, it should not require more than two tons of limestone per acre, but as the plants grow, they build up organic matter from the decay of the voluminous older roots. This undoubtedly increases the calcium requirement. Also, these soils are acid throughout the depth of the profile, each acre foot layer requiring as much limestone as the surface layer. Over the years, the lower level in the profile becomes calcium saturated, permitting deeper rooting and increasing the calcium requirement even more. I don't suppose the time would come when this grower could feel sure that his soil was completely saturated with calcium that he had applied sufficient limestone to grow his biggest possible yield. Theoretically, he should have reached a saturation point by 1945 on this soil type, but he apparently was benefiting by additional limestone applications. When he once reaches the saturation point, the yield should level off and continue to maintain that level for 10 or more years before it becomes necessary to apply additional limestone.